Welcome back. This is our Monday Mindset. And it's been a minute because we took a week off last week, but I've been so impressed with this is our Monday Mindset. About all the wonderful folks who have joined us in our um, Raising Our Resilience parent community. I've just seen um, such big hearted parents come through with kids ages two to 12. Um, and even older, I have some grandparents who have joined. And what I keep seeing are some themes. Some themes when I ask the question, what's the hardest thing about raising kids right now? Um, things like managing big emotions and being able to um, get the kids on board with chores and routines, all the things that you know kind of trip us up from having the kind of relationships and the kind of daily life that we really desire with our kids. So if you're here tuning in, let me know where you're tuning in from. Put your, um, the city, like I would say, you know, El Cerrito, which is in San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, California. And uh, let me know the ages of your kids and everybody here and say hello to each other in the chat. Make sure you um, will keep welcoming everyone into this community, into this conversation, which is what, what does it take from us <laughs> to be able to raise our resilience get our own calm parent strategies, get our own motivation tools, get our own sort of emotion coaching tools to be able to pass them on to our kids in ways that are really powerful. And we get to become better people along the way. And that's really the, the big gift, the opportunity that having children um, presents us and that we can claim for ourselves. So welcome, if you're here, you've already taken a really good, great step towards having more tools and strategies for yourself and for your children. So well done. And we've had some really important and really wise questions come in. And I know that you'll hear things that um, you can relate to as we go along. And when you do, make sure you let us know that you, you see this person, you hear them, you understand what they're going through too. And remember to introduce yourself, your name, um, you know, your name will be there, but your the ages of your kids and where you're tuning in from. And if you also have a question that I don't cover, or you just want to put cue it up, go ahead and put it in the comments in the chat. Okay. I always love that. So we can, I can coach you live here. Um, one of my clients, Jessica Hart, I just got off of, um, I'll give her a little shout out here. Um, she, uh, she and I just had a really great session and she found me here on one of these Facebook lives and asked me anything. I answered one of her questions and I just so admire her big heart. Um, recently, she claimed that she's no longer going to let any fear she has rule her, but that she's going to be a, what we call, we end up calling a love warrior, <laughs> a love warrior. In other words, fierce and strong, but so loving and kind for to guide her teenager through some really big changes coming up. Oh, Patty's here. Welcome, Patty. That's right. Zero years old, not even a month yet. <laughs> Thank you for saying hello. Welcome back. Um, and I know you're in the Bay Area. That's right. Um, and I'm, the very first question we're going to be answering, by the way, let us know how your baby's doing. And Andrea's here as well. Yay, Andrea, we're going to answer your question second. I'm so excited that you made it. I know you've been coming to some of these for a while now, so glad that you could be here live um, from San Diego with your five-year-old and your two-year-old. Welcome. So Teresa, we're opening up with her question, which is, so she has a four and a half uh, and a one-year-old and she came to our six day training last month and we got to know each other really well through a strategy session. And she said, the hardest thing is setting limits that stick and motivating them to participate in personal responsibility. Ooh, this is so good. This is so, so good. Helping children respect boundaries and take more responsibility. How many would like some of that? Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and the ways that this has, can have so many effects um, uh, all across your day, all across the, the months and years to come. So, and even now I'm working with a, a parent of a teenager about doing some kind of like some backfilling because what can happen is if you don't have the kids sort of in the practice of taking personal responsibility from an early age, it can lead to them being a lot more sort of entitled and sort of expecting that um, you'll do things for them. Like a client just shared with me and a Teresa, you might be able to relate to this concern and uh, Andrea and Patty as well. Like she's gotten to the point where with her, her child, she'll say, oh, um, you know, <laughs> um, it's it's not actually my job to clean up after you all the time, you know. And to to her to her child's age, 
um, level, um, she wants to start bringing in more personal responsibilities like bringing your dishes to the sink from your room. This is a teenager. Um, uh, bringing your dirty clothes down to the washer so that then it can be washed. And then she's going to build up to actually putting your clothes in the washer and running the washer and, and part at least participating in that, maybe contributing to some of the meal prep, con con contributing some of, to the clean some of the cleaning of the house and the kitchen and the dishes. But right now she's starting at this very basic level of like bring your dirty things to where, the place where they get cleaned. And we had a we had a little sober moment actually in our session recently, just kind of getting real of like, I wish she wishes she had started sooner because now it's a sort of uphill battle. Her child said, um, well, because she, she had said something like, would you, well, how, what do you think it's going to be like when you have children, you know, someday and they don't, you have to do everything for them, even clean up their messes. And her child is now old enough to say things like, well, I'm just not going to have kids then because it's too much of a hassle. Whew, much tougher conversation than we might be having with our four or six, eight or 10 year old. So if you have younger kids, this is your chance to kind of get ahead of it. So I'm so glad Teresa is bringing this one up. So here's where I would start with the young, young ones. I wouldn't make it separate from daily life, like kind of fold it into what's happening around them in their routine all the time. Um, and oftentimes what it takes us doing is picking one, two or three kind of chores or tasks around the house and deciding that it's it, this is the time that you're going to teach your child how to do it and involve them. Because otherwise what we tend to do is we tend to just do as do the things that do as many of the things that we can ourselves because it'll go faster. It's easier when we do it. Um, you don't think your kid is old enough yet and then to even try. Oh, Jessica's here. Hey, Jessica. Welcome. So what can end up happening is that um, we'll just do it for them anyway, because it's just not worth the hassle of like getting them to do it or, or um, you know, teaching them how, or it might take slower or like longer time, or they might not do as good of a job as you. So I would just sort of like do a little inventory of your, of your day and say like, what are like one, two or three things that you could start actually putting on your child's plate? Things that you think they're ready for, things that you think they um, would even in, learn to enjoy, or that you would you know you could have enough patience for. And the reason I say one, two, or three things, and not all ten or twelve things at once, is that you we also have to be kind of practical about um, if you try to do too many things at once, we get more pushback, but also we're less likely to actually follow through. So I know Jessica, when I was just chatting about picking one or two things, right? <laughs> In terms of um, transferring some personal responsibility over to the kids. So oftentimes too, we need to sort of understand that there's a learning curve, there's a learning cycle, we'll call it. So first they see you do it and then you, and then you can tell them about it. Then you show them, then you involve them and then they show you and then they do it themselves, yeah? So it's sort of like introduce practice with, with support, practice on your own and then on your own. And oftentimes kids will be like, uh, and you will like kind of forget that your child had to, fig had to learn how to flush the toilet, for example, or had to learn how to um, you know, hold a fork properly. So we can take for granted the things that our kids have already learned and forget that it's, it did take some time. So I would invite all of you right now who are listening, I'm sure we can all pick at least one thing we'd love our kids to do more of that you could bring them through that cycle with, if they're young especially, something they truly just don't know how to do yet, skills-wise, okay? So, um, or just the desire for your child to take more responsibility. So in the chat, in the comments, go ahead and write down one thing you would love your child to, to start learning how to do more and more independently, taking more personal responsibility around the house. So Teresa, this one's for you. Your four and a half year old, I would say, you know, maybe one cleaning thing. Yeah, one cleaning thing would be really helpful and one like, taking care of their own needs thing, right? So teaching them how to get a, you know, putting the cups down in a lower cabinet so that he, he can reach, you're thinking of your older child, he can reach it and so he can take it out himself and then fill, maybe put a little pitcher of water on a low shelf in the fridge um, that he could learn, he could learn to go get his own glass of water and pour it. And then also showing him where the glass goes when he's done, you know, first it's in the sink and later getting him a step stool so he can step up and he can actually like, you know, use a little sponge and rinse it out. I've had three, four or five year olds definitely do their dishes. And then guess what? I do their dishes afterward. <laughs> I do it. It's like, it's like, oh, you started them. I'll finish them. Right. So like they start the cleaning, but it's getting them into that, 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 um, 
idea that if I make something dirty, then I clean it. And it establishes that nice and young for you, Teresa, with your four and a half year old. Andrea is saying, so true, always needing to pause and think if your expectations are realistic. Yeah. So I don't want you to let go of your goal, though. If your goal is for them to be doing something independently, you know, I've gotten classrooms of um, four, five, and six-year-olds or six, seven, and eight-year-olds um, on board with doing things like animal care and watering the plants and scrubbing the tables and cleaning up the floor and looking for any messes to, and like things to put away, re-rolling the rugs, um, you know, uh, all kinds of things, Scrub scrubbing a counter. Like I've gotten them on board with it because I was willing to identify what it was, take the time to teach them, call it take time out for training and then and support them along the way with patience. So that's why again, pick one, two or three things at the most at a time. So Patty picks out, picking out his own clothes. Really good one. I like that one for you, Patty. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe, like I said, like scaffold it is, is the way that we describe it with when it comes to learning terms. But what you do is kind of like once, like break it down into steps of like stages of support. So maybe first you show him and you tell him a bit. Okay. Then next you do it with, do it together. And then maybe next he does it and, and shows you and you and, and you're just there to like give him praise and attention and be there if he needs any help. And then finally, the expectation you can you can have is that he will then do it. But maybe you could gather his input a little bit about like when it happens, or if he's doing it the night before, or if he's doing it right after he brushes his teeth, or what it when maybe could be a place he could have some autonomy and some choice. Yeah, Patty, nice one. I love it. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Let me know if you hear anything along the way that stands out to you, take a note. People love that. It helps helps other people who come back and listen to the replay or for the other folks who are here. We've got Patty, we've got Andrea, we've got Jessica here, maybe some other folks who will be tuning in on Zoom soon. All right, so let's help each other out. So the next question is Andrea's. Um, and I would say, Trista, about setting limits that stick, that's such a big one, you know? And I know it's not exactly the words you, you used when you described it, but it's basically what we saw, you know, from, from I think the little survey in the questions, you said that was the one you wanted the most support with. And I think there's something about approaching limits as a way of sort of like establishing how we do as a family, um, rather than you respect me. <laughs> or you listen to me it's kind of like how do we do like how do we do the morning routine how do we do getting ready transi transitioning to a meal how do we how do we do leaving the table how do we do cleaning up our toys right and it's sort of a, like it's there's a lot of learning in there and a lot of building in some routines that kind of get ahead of that conflict where he's you know I know you've got a little boy and I'm like he's throwing it out and being like nope <laughs> not doing it. There's a whole other piece around how to follow through when they're like, they're saying no, which we can talk more about, Teresa. And those of you who are interested, I love chatting about the inner strategy sessions. Tanisha's really feeling the, uh, the watch me, do it with me, do it while I watch, do it on your own. Yes, right? Like it's so gentle and so clear that progress is being made at the same time, which just feels good for everybody. And you get to kind of praise the progress rather than being frustrated that they're not all the way there yet. So just slows it down, stretches it out a bit, and it just feels much, much better for everybody. I'm glad that that's resonating with you. And thank you for writing it out. Really good, Tanisha. Yeah, way to, way to support the other folks here. Um, you're, you're acting like a lot of the folks in my year-long program. We do this for each other all the time. We're always taking, taking notes in the chat. I know Allie and Tiffany, Elizabeth, a lot of other folks who are just joining too, like Lee and Sarah, who are in this bigger group as well, can attest to that, how much we help each other out. So thank you, Tanisha. Um, Andrea is saying, how do I stay patient uh, and show a consistent reaction to the same behavior that I'm trying to correct? Well, Andrea, I would say, please don't do this on your own. Because here's what I've seen. When parents have a chance to have a thought partner, to think it through with. Like right now, I would love for you, Andrea, if you're here, put something in the chat of like something that you want to have a consistent reaction about. And when you get a chance to like talk about that through with a mentor, with me, or even with the other folks who are here in the group, you get to get more, you get to kind of get behind it in a different way that's much more clear. And so the remembering isn't that hard. Like the being consistent becomes easier. Yeah. Um, 
because if you just make a decision on the fly and then you and then you don't kind of solidify it with your community or solidify it with your mentor or solidify it with your co-parent if there's another a caregiver in your world it can be hard to to have it stick you know even for yourself um and so the consistent reaction to a behavior could look something like i'm going to tune in first and respond second like that like we call connect before you correct right and so I have so many folks who end up in my world, either here in the bigger group or in one of my programs, either my private coaching intensive or my year long family foundations immersion program that end up saying connect before you correct, connect before you correct. And even just that little thing that a little like self-talk helps them to what you were saying, um, Andrea is like wanting more patience. It helps them to sort of remember that their relationship comes first. And that if they correct or respond from a connected place, then they're much more likely to be like, um, not only more kind about it or more patient about it, but like also more insightful. Here's an example. You can come into a room and see a kid doing something and immediately tell them, stop that. Yeah. How many of you have done it? I've totally done it so many times. Like, what do you do? Or like, what are you doing? You know, and that's not what you're talking. That's not what you're aiming for, right, Andrew? Like a patient response. Yeah, it's a bit reactive. It's maybe even presumptuous, right? And you go like, what are you doing? Or something, right? And I see you wrote more, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but let me finish this one. So we can we can um, forget to connect with them and get into their world a little bit. Like a different version of that same question and be like, oh, I see you're standing on a chair, reaching on, uh, up on top of the fridge. <laughs> Just that, I'm noticing you. Oh, I see you, I see you. Um, looks like you're trying to get something. Like that's connection right there, right? Or like, wow, you're so, you're getting so tall. Look, look like you're reaching up so high. Um, rather than what are you doing on that chair? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, connecting a bit, right, before you correct. Um, can make such a difference because then they'll, they'll they might they might know that they're already doing something they're not supposed to do and they'll be like oh and then they'll say nothing well i was trying to get the thing and then i got the chair and then they're like now you're in a story with them you get to like work with them on it and they don't already feel like they're in big trouble that's just an example of connecting before correcting um we often can come into the room and completely interrupt what they're doing too with what we want from them and then we basically teach them anytime you want something come into a room and interrupt me <laughs> yeah, so there's a bit of role modeling there too that's kind of uh, fun to play with, but let's look at Andrea's. So she says, defiance at bedtime, shower time. Okay, I feel sometimes I'm more patient and sometimes I'm less. And yes, my husband can approach it differently, which is frustrating, but I have to admit he has good strategies like giving our five-year-old more options mm -hmm, with, and more control in the process. Good, okay. Yeah, you know, and it's good to notice when your care, your other caregiver, whether it's a co-parent or another caregiver in your child's life is approaching it differently and like taking some notes when it works really well. And it also feels like aligned with what your bigger goals are, like having a great relationship or helping them learn respect and things like that. Tanishna likes, likes the noticing instead of just going, no, 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 no. Yeah, nice. And Tanisha, did you let us know how old your kids are yet? I think you told me before, but do you mind popping it in again so I can support you even better today? Thank you. So yeah, so when you're wanting more of that consistent uh, consistency at bedtime and shower time, like I hear you and I feel like you're taking on a lot there about how patient you're being. And I wonder two things. I wonder if there's a way, if you know that evening times can be hard or frustrating I wonder if there's a way you can build in, and I always like to call it like in my, my, my 20 minutes of Zen. I wonder if you can build in 20 minutes of something that helps you to sort of reclaim a bit of your nervous system from the day. And what I mean by that is just sort of hitting a reset button for yourself so that before you go into what can often be a difficult bedtime and shower time, you're just feeling more resourced so that that patience comes not from because it should be here, but because you've actually given yourself an opportunity to cultivate it. I think that could really be a, a key thing to build in, Andrea. And if your husband tends to approach it differently and sometimes has good strategy, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, or you're not loving it all the time. I wonder though, if he could, if he could get on board with 
helping you get those 20 minutes of Zen or 20 minute, 20 minute reset time so that you can, um, you know, actually turn off from parenting for a moment, like go and like lay down with your, like I have done a full face plant, like face down on the bed for 20 minutes, just like, oh, like, like just, it's the equivalent of when you go like this and you just kind of collapse and give your nervous system a break from all the stimulation around you something like that or something, maybe it's taking like a brisk walk around the block. Maybe it's um, taking a shower, you know, some, like I was just, someone just asked me like, how do you recharge yourself? Um, and I was like, wow, I actually ha can think of like 10, they said, think of five. And I thought of like 15. <laughs> and so thinking of just helping you with your self care list, this is something we do a deep dive on in the immersion in our emotional mastery weekend. We do a virtual retreat twice a year and we actually like explore different kinds of tools and really get to know what, what ours are. We even create like res this resilience anchor that one of our coaches, Coach Crystal is really good at creating for us. But um, yeah, just starting there with like get, coming to it with, with like almost like a guarantee of a better nervous system, Andrea, as a place to start. Then the other thing that's a little bigger and Andrea, I think we should probably talk about this one. Let me grab a link for you so you can get on my calendar. Um, Let's see. Yeah, here's the link. I'll put it in. You can get straight onto my calendar. You can skip the quiz, okay? Um, is to talk, think about um, ways to get that bedtime and shower time routine running more smoothly. Like this is one of my expertise. This is something that people come into my world for help with routines and then they stay because <laughs> then they realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more we can do together. But I wonder about us like kind of workshopping through that bedtime and shower time routine for you, Andrea, so you have some things you can try right away in the session and see if it's a good fit for us to work together or for you to even hop in to our year long immersion that starts this month. Um, let's chat more about that. One thing I can, one tip I can give everybody here though, is that if you want a routine to go more smoothly, you've, you've got to, and especially one that gets really stuck, um, you've got to get the kids on board with it when you're not in the middle of it, yeah? So uh, oftentimes we don't think about this, but you know, I like to use the analogy or the metaphor of a play to make it like a play. So if I threw a bunch of people onto a stage and said, okay, now act out a scene where one of you's a taxi driver and the other one's trying to hail a cab in the rain, go. Well, improv can be fun, but improv all day long, <laughs> that sounds, I don't know about you, but it sounds exhausting, yeah? Now, how different would those players feel who got thrown up on the stage if I said, okay, look, we're gonna, here, let's, let's sit down together and plan out this scene together. What kind of, what kind of mood do you wanna, are you gonna be in? What kind of, um, you know, things do you need? Like, do you need a steering wheel so you can go like this? Or, um, you know, what supplies do we need? Um, what role are you each playing? Um, how do we know when the scene should be almost over and it's time to transition to the next scene? which is oftentimes what bedtime is. It's like lots of transitions. When you kind of talk it through like a play, even with the little ones, they really get on board. Like I have a client who has a now four-year-old and the, there were certain parts of the routine that weren't going very smoothly. And one of the things they did was they started to role play it out a little bit and make a little chart. And just practicing it together was such a huge deal. Like it made such a difference and it turned into one of their favorite parts of the day instead of like an upsetting part of the day. The other thing that might happen is there might be something that 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 he's having a hard time letting go of at, at bedtime. I know a lot of kids, raise your, you know, not raise your hand, but just like, yeah, right? I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. Like they don't want to stop playing or they don't want to like, they want you to leave their room or they want one more book. They just, or they're like, come up with excuses of like, I don't want to, I don't want to get out of the shower. I don't want to get into the shower. There's all these transition moments that are hard. Um, and there's a way to sort of say, okay, what is it that they're really trying to get more of here? And how can we build it into the routine so that they, they feel complete with that and can move on more easily. So there's a lot of tips and tricks we can kind of like work in to any routines that are not running smoothly for any of you. So if that's appealing to you, grab a spot in my calendar. I just opened up sessions through Monday um, and we'll see, maybe it's even a time for you to jump into the immersion, which would be cool. Um, I have another one here. Andrea, I hope you feel complete. If there's something, a follow-up question, put it in the chat, okay? 
So this one's for Kim Scott um, and Christy Higgins. And, you know, fun, it's funny. Facebook is so funny. Sometimes it lets me um, tag people and other times it doesn't. So I'm going to try this. I think this is the right Kim. We'll see. And then I have Christy. And their question is, um, how do I prevent my younger child from copying the bad behavior of my older children? Oh my gosh. Oh, so many, I have so many clients who have this question. It comes up a lot. It does come up a lot. So I'm glad that Christy took the time to write this in for her, her form. And I, it's funny, I have like three or four Christy Higgins. So I'm not sure if this is the right one. But um, Christy, you have a popular name, it turns out. All right, so when we have, when we're talking about copying bad behavior from an older child, first of all, what's, what's going on with the older child? I just have to ask. <laughs> I have to bring attention to that. Um, and what kinds of behaviors, right? Um, I have had older, child, older children who are uncooperative with chores, older children who are uncooperative with, um, you know, not using potty language, older children who were constantly negotiating with their, their parents. And then it would make it so difficult for the parents then when the younger one would kind of chime in too. And the next thing you know, it's like, um, you know, it's one against three instead of <laughs> the other ways. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to find the right Christy at this moment. I'll have to tag you later, honey. Um, so one thing you can do is um, you can, you know, coach your older child about being a role model, but it's really a delicate thing. Because if you're, if the only reason you want them to change their behavior is to set a good example for their younger brother or sister or, you know, they, them, it's, it's not usually enough. Um, especially if it's just done sort of sporadically one, once in a while, like kind of a one-off. But there is a way to build a culture around you're older and you, in a lot of ways, you're more important. Like I give you more important tasks to do. I give you more important roles to like be my helper with things. I let you handle the, you know, more dangerous things like maybe standing at a hot stove or, um, and like flipping the pancakes at the hot stove or pouring some, the batter on, or, um, Maybe it's things like uh, cutting things with sharp knives. You know, you just sort of elevate their status in the in the household in general. And what that can end up doing is it can end up making them feel more important. And then they start to kind of grow into the role of being that older sibling role model. Because if we skip from like, you're behaving badly, don't be a bad example, to set a great example for, for your older, your old, your younger siblings that can sometimes too big of a leap and they don't really feel that incentivized, honestly. Because <laughs> if they haven't already figured that out, like it's not probably gonna come from a conversation. But over time, helping them see that they play a significant role in the family, giving them more responsibility, give them more, giving them more important tasks does count. It makes a difference over time. So that's one thing. The other thing would be, you know, potentially depending on how old your older child is, um, bringing in the tool of the family meetings. And family meetings can be really helpful because they allow us to do things like um, bring up topics that normally you wouldn't necessarily be able to bring up um, on the fly because you've set the context for that conversation. And um, I'll see if I can see, I think Christy's older older child, um, I wanna see how old, how old your older child is, Christy, because I think you might've shared that with me. But um, what can often happen is um, when you give them a chance to um, step up to the plate and even, um, you know, have a little role. Okay, okay, it's six and one. Six-year-old, you have a six-year-old with some mood management challenges. Okay, got it. And a one-year-old, um, okay, who's copycatting a bit. Got it. That's, that's, that's a lot of good information. We can go off of that. Um, so what you might want to consider then is, you know, when, when you're trying to get them, them to your six-year-old to role model better for your younger one, um, you, can, you can coach your older one really openly in front of the younger one. That can, be a, that can make a huge difference as well. So I've often even like involved the little one a little bit and being like, watch how I show big sister how to take deep breaths and then you just have the baby on your hip. 
okay, sweetheart, in and out, you know? And then there's so many different ones. Like the little ones also like to do things like with their hands, right? Um, so they might like to try the roller coaster breath because they're like kids are so into their bodies when they're that age. Um, and I wonder about modeling coping tools, um, like how, like instructing or modeling them to your six-year-old while your one-year-old is watching can be really helpful. Another thing is to get more firm about um, shifting to another space away from the one-year-old, like even just around the corner when they're doing some of the things that you're worried about, like whether maybe she's screaming or kicking or hitting or biting or throwing things, those are really common, um, destroying stuff um, and really making sure she, like your six-year-old moves to another space while that is all happening, while it's playing out. So those are two hot tips there for you, Christy. Um, and, Kim, let me check you out. So Kim, looks like you have a two, a five, and a six and a half year old. So very similar. We've got a five year old. Um, the middle child, your middle child's behavior. You're worrying about outbursts and things. So those two tips really connect to what I just shared too about Christie's ages of kids. So yeah, getting modeling the mood, the mood, like the the calm down tool, the mood management tool in front of the two year old, emotionally coaching your five and six year olds, especially your middle child through their emotions, helping them tune into their body, name their emotion, calm down, noticing, like pointing out when they calm down, like, look how good, look how well your, your older sibling um, put their lid back on. Wow, good job. It's a good, good job, you know? Um, and so involving the little one and sort of witnessing the process of calming down, witnessing the expectation to, you know, leave the space if you're being destructive or harmful in any way can be a great way to do it. And then in general, I would just love Kim and Christy, I mean, I guess I'm recommending it to you too, <laughs> um, to come and hop on my calendar, let's jam, let's talk about it more because I opened up these sessions, might as well take advantage of them. These are complimentary 20 to 30 minute sessions where we'll go deeper on these questions. I can get you some more support. Yeah, because there might be more dynamics in play that I'm not aware of that we could get more detailed about and we can get more personalized support. Um, Lily Hayes Wong has a great question. Lily, I'm gonna to try to tag you as well. Um, so Lily, when, when you ask about, here we go. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, so Facebook's not letting me tag. Um, I'll have to come back and tag you later. So when, when uh, Lily, you're saying that you'd like to raise kids to be more trusting, you know, I'm wondering where it's breaking down. Um, and then also you want to make sure that they're careful about who to be vulnerable with, like who is a safe adult, for example. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a lot around helping kids like become kind of social scientists where they can read, they can kind of read people better. Um, and when you, they read people better, and I know this is your five-year-old that you're wondering about how to do this. Um, so being able to read people starts with just with the noticing. Like being able to notice other people's facial expressions, noticing their body language. Um, and then when it comes to safety, like, you know, sort of community safety, just general kids safety, um, they always say like, is this a trusted adult? In other words, is this an adult that another trusted adult introduced you to, to, to you? Um, like, so is this, is this someone that mommy knows? Is this someone that daddy knows? Is this someone that, um, you know, sister knows? Um, and if not, and they're talking to you, and if and you feel funny, go find a trusted adult. So helping them identify who their trusted adults are. And it's not necessarily to say like trust or don't trust. It's sort of go find the person you do trust to help you, support you when you're not sure. Yeah. And so the word trusted adult is a really good one I've used with preschoolers and, and preschool, I mean, and um, kindergartners who are around the age of your child. Um, and the other thing is, um, to learn to be trusting and vulnerable, I mean, I'll just go back to the modeling. Like, are you sharing your true thoughts and feelings? Are you admitting when you're making mistakes? Are you vulnerable in saying, you know, I'm sorry? Um, that goes a long, long way. Like what we do versus what we, what we show versus what we tell can be 10 times more impactful. Like if I am saying, calm down and I'm doing this, the main thing you're getting from me is not calm down. It's I'm angry at you and um, and I process my anger by trying to make you do things, right? But if I say, let's all calm down 
I'm going to take a few breaths and you go, I think I even need to tense him at least three times, which is all in our calm down training that we did last month. Um, and if you want those strategies, let me know. I'll put the, I can put the link in the chat to the free gift or you can like grab those six strategies. Um, you'll have to read through them. We don't have the, the videos for you unless you join the immersion, then you get it as a bonus, you get all the videos, but um, I can at least share the, share the gift with you, right? The six, the six ways to, to um, six ways to cool down in the moment. But what I'm saying around modeling goes for anything, whether it's modeling grace and courtesy, or if it's modeling how to handle um, your emotions, or if it's modeling how to be kind to yourself when you make a mistake, or how to how to apologize well. All of these skills we can model for our kids, and when we really own that, it also helps guide us into like being more consistent, like Andrew was hoping to be, or um, being more clear on what, what we want or what we expect, like Teresa was saying about setting limits. Part of that is that clarity. And if we want, do we want our kids to bark at us and say, don't do that, stop that. Or, um, um, you know, like, how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> if we want our kids to talk to us like that, then by all means, please talk to your kids that way. <laughs> Um, it's going to happen anyway, but my point is like, if we can move towards modeling what we want from the kids, they are going to learn faster. Things like how to be patient, how to be vulnerable, how to be forgiving, how to be um, willing to make mistakes and learn from them, willing to talk about hard things, willing to process our emotions. We have to be able to do that too. So Lily, I'm, I'm curious if that helped you and if there's more that you need help with, let me know. Okay. Um, so I've got another one here from Kelly and then Tanisha, who's here for her, her question, I think. Hopefully she's still here. Um, you're up next. Um, and Tanisha, it says, well, how do I keep me and my family calm? Well, we've already covered quite a few things and I just gave you a gift too that will help you with that. <laughs> and I think your question was probably a bit more uh, specific than that, but it kind of was the theme that ran between the three of you. Um, and again, it's not letting me um, tag you all, so I'll, I'll do it in a separate thing. But I wonder, um, Tanisha, if you're here still, let me know a little bit more about what happens when you're not calm. Like, what are some of your tells? I would invite you to start asking yourself, what are some of your tells that you're not staying calm, right? That your lid is sort of flipping. We use that language quite a bit in our um, meltdowns training. We talk a lot about what, what it can look like when your lids are flipping. Because the more you get to know like your own sort of stress and distress symptoms, the more likely you're going to be able to um, catch it in the moment. Yeah, before you get to the place where you would say you've really lost your calm. Because calm all the time is not really, a, and I'll just be honest, this is not a very um, like achievable goal. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not saying that no one can do it. Cause I think after about 15 years in the classroom, I think I finally got there where I was calm, like 95% of the time, which except, except for days that I didn't get enough sleep or was sick or something, right. Stressed about something else, but I would got to a place where I wasn't reacting to the kids anymore. I was just responding and I was really happy about it, but um, I don't want it to take 15 years for you. So let's get it faster. Um, so the six strategies I shared with you, things like breathing tools, somatic tense and release tools, um, building in that pause, which is kind of like one of the top level skills, tuning into your senses, lightening up. These are all in the guide. So go ahead and grab it for yourself. Put your name on that in that email, um, your email and your name, and it'll kick it to you right away. Um, they, those are not a one size fits all. So what I would encourage each of you to do, Kelly, Tanisha, and Saw also asked this question, um, is keep trying different ones until you find the one that becomes your go-to. Like my Megan Stacy, who's one of one of the our staff here. I'll put her name in here so she can say hi later. Um, she uh, she swears by the roller coaster breath. Like she loves it. Like even you know, as an adult, you know, you think, oh, you shouldn't be doing these cute things or whatever. But no, like she actually gets a ton out of using a roller coaster breath, it really helps her. And so she'll say in our, in our six day training, she'll say things like, um, it works for me, I like the roller coaster breath. And the roller coaster breath is when you breathe in and you breathe out and you breathe in and you breathe out. 
and you can do it anytime, anywhere. You don't even have to trace your fingers, but there is something soothing about sort of like gently touching these inter interspaces between your fingers, giving your hands a little love, maybe a little massage too. It can be really nice, especially those of you who work on the computer or with your hands a lot. And that can be really helpful because when you can find your own best fit strategy, like the one that you will remember exactly, Andrea, then you can model them for your daughter or for your children. And um, it's just much more likely to be used. The other thing I have to say is that it might be time for kind of a family reset or family reboot around things like um, how do we do conflict? Um, how do we run our routines? Um, what are our limits and expectations? Um, and how are we gonna deal with it when our, our kids don't follow them? Um, these are things that we address in the immersion. Like we work on them, routines in July and then limits, you know, setting limits in August. And then we kind of, we're doing a big motivation piece too, like ways to motivate our kids without rewards and punishments. If that sounds appealing to you, like getting a reboot because what I've noticed is like going into each school year, families can really make a, it's like a really ripe time to shift things significantly and set a new pattern. Does that make some sense? Like you're about to go back into a pattern of drop off and pick up, or maybe you're still in it. But for many of you, like September, late August is a time where you're going to have this opportunity to kind of reset and reboot. And so if it's at all interesting you, to you to like, lean into the possibility of this summer being a time where you kind of reset and reboot and then you can get to know a community that could support you through the whole school year. I'm, I'm gonna drop a note in here that there's just one week left to join our immersion in time to attend our Motivation Mastery Weekend. And it's the same link to the strategy session, but I would love to know, you know, if anybody here would like to learn more, just put say like, yes, please, that sounds great for me. Like, just let me know, put a little, raise your hand on it or, or like it. Um, because creating more calm in the household, more ease, more sort of we're on the same team, it can, it can be like a bit of a project. And I say that with a big smile because it starts out feeling like a big project or a big chore. And then it starts to become like delightful. Like you get to shift your daily family life significantly and most times like permanently. Folks who end up working with me for six months in a private coaching intensive or a year long in the immersion, they say that like they can't go back. They can't actually go back to how things were because there's too much learning has happened, too, many, too much growth has happened, too many breakthroughs have happened. And the things that you used to do when you weren't calm or like you couldn't find that calm sort of melt away. Like I've had all these grads, I had 15 families graduate and four of them decided to you know, renew and actually have a whole other year of mentorship with me. And it wasn't because they, feel, they felt like they didn't fix their problems. It was because they had such a significant amount of change in such a, a important way and with community and support. So whether it's with me, I don't, actually don't care. It's with me or some other mentor in your community, like consider how fun it might be in the end, at the end of the day and like satisfying and how much you might grow as a person um, and also bring that into other spaces if you were to dedicate some time to some structured learning around things like routines and setting limits and conflicts and you know how to motivate kids with less rewards and punishments like it's kind of amazing what happens some of you have been noticing stories popping up in the Facebook group and I share them because I don't want any parent to struggle with things like this and not know that there's an opportunity to not have to do it by yourself. I'm not saying you can't, like we can DIY so many things. Like I have a friend who DIY like how to turn um, how, like his own like compost system. And now he's got this beautiful fertilizer that he's like sharing with his neighbors. Like you can DIY anything, but when it comes to parenting, like I just wanna invite you to say to you that you don't have to. Yeah, like there's something for you to hold you, a container, a container, a, a system, uh, a mentor, a community. And again, whether it's with me or someone else, doesn't matter, but just know it's out there for you. Because a lot of times we're just getting this message that we're supposed to be able to do all this on our own. 
And I don't see why, <laughs> like, why, why would that be, right? Like, this is such a big undertaking. This is one of the biggest projects ever, which would be to raise a whole human being, right? Um, and that's why we have these Mondays as well. So I'm glad you're here. Um, Andrea, you say, yes, good. Andrea, get on my calendar or let me know if for some reason one of those dates doesn't work, okay? So I would click on it now just to make sure you grab a good time for yourself, okay? And I love that you're, you're claiming your yes. That's really powerful. Um, so then Franziska and Nadia and Sarah would all like to know how to focus on more lovable behaviors and not getting hung up, hung up on the others, especially with a child with special needs. I love this question. And it's how we kick off every cohort in my program too. So to me, there's seven pillars. I've got motivation, emotions, uh, so mastery of those, how to motivate, how to how to manage our emotions. We've got setting limits and, and running routines. That's another two that are just like daily life things and also conflict resolution. But then there's these two pieces that kind of come once you start getting all these things running, which is getting on the same page about your goals and really feeling like a team. And then the next one is getting to enjoy a positive relationship. And two things I wanna share with Francisca, Nadia, Sarah, and anyone else who's listening is that for a positive relationship to maintain positivity, in other words, so that if you, if a child were to ask you, like, do you and your, do you and your mom have a good relationship? Or in reflect upon reflection, they're in their twenties, they're in college, they're, 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 they're dating and their new girlfriend or boyfriend or partner says, do you feel like you had a good relationship with your parent when you were growing up? You would, if you'd like the answer to be yes, <laughs> check this out there needs to be a four to one ratio, a four to one ratio of positive interactions to negative interactions. Oh man, that was like, oh, I was like, really? Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and the reason I kind of like had this like resistance to it, you heard it in the, oh no, is that how many day, how many like especially routines like morning routines and bedtime routines, or even at the dinner table, how many times are you like, reminder, reminder, correction, reminder, uh, consequence, choices, oh, I got a little break. Oh, good job, honey. Well, that was like six negative to one positive. <laughs> and this one really kind of turned things around for me in the classroom too, when I had like 28 children that year. I remember when I learned this, I was like, I'm going to have to really up my game on acknowledgements and appreciations and seeing the good. And so I give my clients hacks on how to reframe things more positively. So I give them really great ways to look through a gratitude sort of perspective. We just did a training on this on Saturday. And those of you who join the immersion will have access to the recording so you can catch up with us if you join, you know, anytime this month. Kind of look through the frame of gratitude. And then I also teach like character strengths, like how to see, oh, like this crazy thing my kid just this really out of the box thing my kid just did. Um, they have a lot of perseverance, zest, <laughs> and leadership. <laughs> um, it just so happens that they don't have a whole lot of teamwork, self-regulation, <laughs> and sort of prudence right now. Um, so you get to start thinking about it in a different way um, to the character strengths model. And then I also, in six months from now, in January, we'll be, um, or, or February, we'll be going through the, the love languages model. And the reason I bring these up to you is not to say, go, go learn all of this at once, but just to know, like, if you don't want to get hung up on the only the negative behaviors, fill up your love cup. Fill it up four to one. Okay. So you just said something that you harped on their, 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 let's say they have um, some attentional difficulty and they like are pretty frenetic. Maybe they're hyperactive and they make lots of noises and you just reminded them a bunch of times, honey, remember I'm on a call, Shh, you know, like stop that or whatever. Um, catch yourself and go crap. Okay. Before I correct him again or her, I need to do four positive interactions with them. So you might do the love languages. You might like give them, give them some sort of loving touch, give them some words of affirmation, um, make a little note and give it to them like a little gift. Ask them if they need help with anything, an act of service. Um, let them know that you can't wait to spend time with them later and make a special plan, quality time. We just roll through all five. Not too hard. That would probably take a whole two minutes. And then maybe when you say, Sweetheart, remember we talked about using your fidget? 
so that you don't tap the computer, um, it doesn't feel like a correction anymore. It just feels like, hey, we're in this together. I'm just here to help you remember because I know this is hard for you. That code can I think, I think it froze for a moment and now we're back. Yeah, I think so. Yep, now we're back. Sorry about that. Um, Shelly and Colleen and Nicole, I was just saying, Renee and also Kara all had similar questions about dealing with angry outbursts and big emotions. And what I can say about that is that when we are, when we are dealing with difficult or negative emotions, it's often because um, we've gotten here somehow <laughs> and being really clear about like what brought this emotion on, like what was the trigger um, can be always very helpful. So identifying the and addressing the trigger more proactively can be really helpful or the precondition. I'm using fancy language because I want all of you to start getting familiar with emotion coaching language and anatomy, like the diagram of the emotional, strong, angry emotional experience. Um, so I wanna invite you into just like really thinking like, okay, what triggered this? What, what set this off? What, what could possibly be the deal here? So that's one thing. The other thing is um, what were the preconditions? In other words, like was my kid hungry or angry or maybe lonely or tired? Like what was going on when this was set off? Is there anything that was kind of- So that's one thing on. or tired. It was like limiting their capacity to be able to handle to handle this, right? Like, could there be something that didn't give give my child the um, resources to be able to navigate this, right? Um, something that's, I would say, I like to bring in the word capacity, something that's maybe limiting their capacity. Um, so really investigating that first is a really great place to start. It brings in some compassion too, of like, then when you go into emotion coaching in the moment, you can more authentically say there's something that makes sense about this. Oh, I get it, honey. You know, it's really hard to be let down when you're um, so tired. Um, oh, I get it, sweetheart. Of course, of course, you're you're um, you're angry. You were already angry about somebody not helping you with your shoes early, you know, a minute ago. So yeah, of course you're flipping your lid. This is like the third thing you're angry about in a row. <laughs> um, or maybe they're like, you know, doing something to get negative to get into some negative attention because they're so low on attention, and maybe because they're a little lonely because they don't have access to their playmates the way they usually do, or something. And you can say, you know what, honey, let's just do a full stop here and let's get let's get grandma on FaceTime so we can. Um, I want you to tell her all about what happened, you know, and and bring in some people. So that's something you can think about. Oh, great, Andrea. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and then the other thing is having a chance to get more familiar with the emotion coaching like cycle, the tool of emotion coaching. And I actually have a way you can have a cheat sheet for that if you take my quiz. So, wow, I'm just throwing all the links into the chat today. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's built in there. So if you take this quiz within a week or so, I will be sending you a link to a, um, a PDF that has the steps of emotion coaching in it like tuning it, helping, helping you and them tune into your body, name the emotion, kind of validate what your experience is enough to actually move through it, not to get stuck and indulge it, but just so, so you can name, like understand what's going on. And then the next step is to choose a way to calm yourself down or work your way through it. And then you acknowledge yourself or the, the smart strategy that you used and what you're ready for next. So I'll, I'll demo it. I'll demo, how about I'll demo doing it for yourself and then I'll demo doing it for a child. And then that's where we'll, we'll wrap up today. If anybody's on and has a question, now's your time, put it in there so I don't miss out a chance to support you. Like I was able to support so many of you today. Um, so here we go. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm like I'm so frustrated because I've been asking so many times for my kid to put their shoes away. I don't understand why it's so hard for them. I'm, I've just reminded them three times. Oh, 
and I'm feeling tense in my shoulders and my fists are clenched. Okay, that's tuning into your body. Um, and naming the motion, I'm frustrated right now. And then the third thing could be is, of course I'm frustrated. This is a frustrating situation to repeat myself so many times and not be heard. This would be frustrating for anybody. But then you don't stay there. You say, okay, but do I really want to hold on to this tension right now? No, okay. I'm gonna do two tense and releases. You tense and release, tense and release. It's usually longer, but tense and release. Okay, roll it out. Whew. All right, I feel more resource now. Like my lid is more back on. Um, for those of you who know the lid, my lid is on a lot better. I think I'm ready to consider what another way to approach this. Oh yeah, Vanessa told me, I'm just making it up. Vanessa told me that um, we can rehearse this like a play. So I'm gonna make some time this evening before story time, but um, after bath time to do a quick little role play where we go outside and we come through the door and we practice putting our shoes on our shoes onto the shelf. Um, that'll feel really good. Okay. So notice how by putting my lid back on, I was able to coach myself through that and then move on to a, a good fit strategy, something that I thought would be a smart strategy and access something that a mentor had told me. Okay, so that's an example of how you can do it for yourself and model it. Now, when your child is the one having it, sometimes you will not be able to do all those steps, but you can try doing at least a couple of them. Wow, honey, your voice is so loud and your face is so red. That tells me you, you, you're upset about something. Um, did I get that right? And if they're like, no, and you're like, okay, well, I still sense maybe something's going on here that's not making you feel not very good um, and that you want something. And then maybe they'll say, mm -hmm. you know, they might go from like, no, to, mm -hmm, you know, <laughs> and then, and then you might say something like, well, okay, got it. So um, what if we stomp it out or like, um, let's, let's stomp it out or like say something really strong, like, I don't like this, you know, and just sort of giving them a way that they can do it. That doesn't involve hitting, kicking, biting, throwing things, you know, punching, whatever it is that they might do instead. Um, give them something they can do or do some wall push-ups or how about we go outside and run, 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 run and just uh, get it out and you might go do it with them. So that's one way. Another is like, you're the problem. I don't like you. And they're coming at you and they're not going to hear you. And you might just say, I see that you need a break, sweetheart. I see that you need a break. Would you like to walk to the calm down corner or would you like me to take you? I don't need a break. Well, sweetheart, we're going to go in the corner so I can either pick you up or you can walk. I, I, you're not walking yet. So does that mean you need me to pick you up? And they're like, no. And then they walk themselves over there or, or they'd say nothing. And then you're like, okay, well, it looks like I'm scooping you up and you have them in their arms. And you're like, did you want to walk yourself? And they're like, they're still not saying anything. Say no. Then you just walk over to the calm down space and you can say, would you like to be here by yourself? Or would you like me to stay building in choices along the way? Um, and then, and, and sometimes you can also distract them and be like, oh, this book you love, you know, and just, get their attention somewhere else. I'm rolling through like six ideas from, from the, the, or a few of the ideas from the six strategies handout, by the way. Um, or maybe we need to, maybe, maybe we should listen to some music and just close our eyes. Like by, by now I'm hoping you can notice that I'm mentioning things like emotion coaching and calm down corner and other things that you would have already had in place. Um, and then when they finally, Sometimes you just have to put them in the room, close the door and sit in front of it and let them bang on the si other side of the door for the first three or four times too, right? But then the important thing is that once they have calmed down, acknowledge that they did it. Like, wow, you really did put your lid back on. I wonder what you did in your room that helped you. Maybe you can tell me all about it later. Now, are you ready to come and check out the shoe shelf and how we can put the shoes away? <laughs> Are you, are you ready to, um, you know, it looks like you might be more ready to at least go into the bathroom and turn on the water. I'm not saying you have to get in the bath right away, but maybe we could at least just go turn on the water. Yeah. Give them one small thing they can say yes to and move towards. So I'm giving you my little, my little cheat sheet kind of um, download there. But if you want to have a physical format of it, go into the parent discovery quiz, quiz opt in to let me know and say yes when it asks you if you want the, the guide and I will kick you an email. It's also a way for you to really see like of the seven pillars, like what do I need help with? Is there something that I would really love to learn more about? Um, what are my goals for my kids right now? It's a really great clarifying exercise. So I've had over 200 people take the quiz and nobody was mad they did it. <laughs> 
everyone was happy. They at least, they at least like checked it out. Um, even got to talk to a mom today, this morning from Minnesota who took the quiz and came to a few sessions. And she's like, wow, you know, I'm getting, becoming, coming to realize that now is my time to really make a difference in my relationship with my child because I'm, I'm kind of using, using strategies that my parents did that really didn't build a good relationship. By the time I was a teenager, I was pretty much living a separate life. And I don't really want that to happen to my, my child. And so if that resonates with you, or if you're kind of curious about, you know, just seeing what it's like to take this kind of quiz, go ahead and go for it. And there's also a place there that you can let me know when you'd like to meet with me for a complimentary session. We'll see if you qualify through that, that, that quiz. So that rounds out our Ask Me Anything. We really covered a lot. I'm so impressed with all of you. We've got another one coming up next week. So you can come and join me in a week on Monday. Um, if you have other questions, you can always put them under the Ask Me Anything post and tag me. Tagging me is great. Or go ahead and get on the calendar so we can talk them through. All right, lots of love to all of you. Really good job today showing up for yourself, showing up for your families. If you missed, if you're just joining, you can um, go ahead and start from the beginning and get to hear it through. I tried my best to tag people in this, the part of the recording that I answered your question. Oh, thanks for all the hearts and likes. I appreciate that. And uh, lots of love to you all. See you next time. Um, and don't forget to say hi if you haven't yet so I know who came and saw the replay. And I, that way we can stay connected. All right. Take care until next time, everybody. Have a great rest of your week and we'll be here for more next Monday. Bye for now.